Praise the Lord. I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 6 here tonight with me as we continue with this Bible study. I believe it's very important, very timely in this hour in world history. Never have we been so close to the fulfillment of all Bible prophecy and yet to misjudge prophecy, to not understand it or to not know the hour that you live in at this time could make you make a lot of mistakes. I want to read from Revelation chapter 6, and this is our second message in this short series, The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Tonight my message is the white horse of peaceful political deception. Reading from Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. So many things began to go wrong tonight as I wrestled through this. So uh, you need to pray for me as we read and pray tonight. Uh, I become very aware when there's opposition, it's not always natural, the things that happen. And when you begin to see that, you realize there's an importance to both preach a thing and to hear it and understand it. If I miss anything tonight through what happened, things that happened, um, then I'll come in in the other weeks. But I do want you to understand this first horse. Never has there been so much confusion around a point in Revelation as I believe this. And it's for this hour that we must understand what it means. Read in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, come and see. And I saw and behold a white horse and he that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, come and see. And there went out another horse that was red and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, come and see. And I beheld and lo, a black horse and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked and behold a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death. And hell followed with him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. Can we pray here together tonight? Father, we do love you. We do worship you. Our eyes are upon the one that was worthy to open up these seven seals. Our eyes are upon him here tonight. We realize there's only one that was found worthy in heaven to open up the seals, O oh God, and to reveal these prophecies. And we worship him tonight. He is the Lamb of God that was slain. He is the one that sits at the right hand of the Father with all power and authority and dominion. And Lord God, we realize that the opening of these seals are going to stir up all of the nations to bring forth the final portion of your will and your purpose in the earth. And we love you tonight. Lord God, make us to see that Christ is in control, that he is sovereign, that he is in charge, that the world is not out of his control, but that he has a plan that he shall fulfill in all of the earth. In Jesus' mighty mighty name. Amen. We're coming to Revelation chapter 6 and tonight I want to begin to teach on the four horses. Do not listen to this message apart from last week's message. Last week's message is vital to understand Revelation 6. We give all of the ingredients and the foundation and the understanding to understand who these four horsemen are. 
They're not just symbols in a vision or a prophecy. They are much, much more than that. Now, this white horse that we're going to deal with tonight, I've called it the white horse of peaceful political deception. I have heard throughout my lifetime, and especially in recent times, this first horse that is found in the first seal misrepresented in so many different ways. I've seen this prophecy taken and interpreted in so many different ways, I don't even have time to touch on it here tonight. You see, there's many in the church that take the prophecies of Revelation, they apply their own thinking, or very often what is happening in the world, and they twist the vision without without keeping it in context. And that is a very, very dangerous thing. You see, the four horsemen do represent something very important. It was in 1986 that Chernobyl in Russia happened, that terrible disaster. All of a sudden, you had a lot of preachers preaching from Revelation chapter 8, verse 11, that it was wormwood. And they said this was the actual fulfillment of it. It was the third trumpet blasting. And they said this is what Revelation was talking about. Chernobyl is wormwood in the third trumpet. Again, I heard in younger years that the fifth trumpet in Revelation chapter 9 and verse 7, where the locusts come up out of the pit, I heard preachers again take that and begin to use it to say that is actually the rock music coming out of the pit of hell. In, in Revelation 9, we see that these locusts have men's faces but women's hair. So what did they do? They took the scripture, applied their natural thinking, and looked at the heavy metal rock stars for this hour, and they begin to apply it. So they took scripture out of context. They kept nothing in its order, nothing in its right uh, place, but they began to look with their eyes and give their own interpretation to a prophecy. We've got to be very, very careful of this. You'll remember in this church, and I warned you about it in uh, September 2017, leading up throughout that year, where they took Revelation chapter 12, and people all across the internet began to look at the woman in the heavens, that vision, and they began to say that really it was going to happen in September 2017, and that Jesus was going to come back, and that the rapture was going to happen in that month. And they said, because all the stars are moving around, and the constellation is all in its right place, the dragon, the woman, the man-child, and they said, because the constellations are moving in that way, we now know it's the fulfillment of Revelation 12. I told you back in that year before it happened, that it was false, it was an erroneous teaching, but you couldn't speak to people. Do you see how all across the church, men are selling books, making movies, selling their ministries on the basis of interpreting the book of Revelation, and yet they are not interpreting it correctly. We had that whole teaching of blood moon sweep through the church. You could buy the books. All the great preachers in America, one after another, started to teach on that. And I wouldn't deny there's some unusual things that happen with these blood moons. But the scriptures they took out of context had nothing to do with it whatsoever. And so we see that men often misinterpret scripture and they abuse scripture. And then there's many who mock scripture saying that isn't Bible prophecy. So I want you to understand this first horse of the apocalypse. I want you to understand what this white horse represents. In church history, many have taught that it was the first century church or what happened uh, from the first century on. It was the spread of the gospel. That's how they tried to interpret it. There are many in our day who say the rider on the white horse is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. They say, look, it's a white horse. It's, he's got a crown on his head. So it must be Jesus Christ. 
That's how they actually begin to interpret it. When you look at Revelation chapter 19, we see clearly that it's Jesus Christ on the back of a white horse. He he is the word of God. He is the one who shed his blood at Calvary. Chapter 19, it is clearly the Lord Jesus Christ and it comes in the right place in the order of Revelation. You see it clearly. But this rider in Revelation chapter 6 is not Jesus. And I'm going to show you why uh, I say that. Others again say that it is the Antichrist. And I believe they're only partially true in that. But I believe they're actually wrong. I don't believe it's Jesus. I don't believe it's Antichrist. When you get Bible teachers about the same little verse in the Bible, one prophecy teacher says, I know it's Jesus. And the other say, I know it's the Antichrist. You've got a problem. You've got a serious problem. And you know what? It means they're not using any rules of biblical interpretation. If one man says it's Jesus and the other says it's Antichrist, you're going to have to use something more than your own opinion or your own thinking. We've got to understand what it means. Then last of all, and I'm just laying, I'm moving out some rubbish before I teach you here. But then there's those in the past year and a half, they, I mean mature Christians, men and women with experience, they've been around the church, and they have told me, I know that this is the coronavirus. I know that the white rider is the coronavirus. Why do you think it's the coronavirus and this crisis? Why do you think last year the white horse rode out and that the first seal was open? Well, it's coronavirus. It's obvious. The word corona means crown in the Latin language. Therefore, there's a crown on the head of the rider of the first white horse. Therefore, I know it is the coronavirus. Now, I want to tell you, if you interpret Bible prophecy like that, you've got serious problems. I mean, Chernobyl doesn't even compare with interpreting this for first horse rider as the coronavirus. I've got no doubt that it is significant what's happening in our world and that the stage is being set. But if that's how you interpret Bible prophecy, you will make very, very major mistakes along the way. I want to show you here tonight who, what, and when this white rider on a horse, on a white horse, is going to ride out. I've got four points here tonight. First of all, the vision opened. Second of all, expounded or explained in its context. Third of all, we're going to place it in its context in all of Scripture. And then fourth of all, I'm going to apply it to the hour that we are now living in. So first of all, as we look at the white horse of peaceful political deception, I want to deal with the vision opened. We see in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 1, read with me here. And it says, and I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. This is the vision or the prophecy opened. It actually gets opened here in this first verse. And who is it that is opening the seal? Who is it who opens up the prophecy and reveals what is hidden within it? It is the Lamb of God. See what we dealt with last week with in Zechariah chapter 1 and Zechariah chapter 6. We saw that the riding out of horses at the command of God, under the instruction of God, and the chariots of different colors, we saw that this was all in the plan of God to stir the nations up to bring about the will of God. When we come to Revelation 6, we see it's not the devil dictating time. He cannot. It's not the devil commanding these horses to ride out. He cannot. He does not have that authority. We actually see, and John has the vision, I saw. He had a vision. He could see it clearly. The lamb opened up one of the seals, or the first seal. And I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, come and see. In the previous chapter, chapter 5, what do we see? We see Christ central in the throne room of heaven. 
The entirety of Revelation 5 centers around the Lamb of God. And in fact, around the opening of this entire prophecy. Look back to Revelation chapter 5 and verse 1. It says, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. This is God the Father sitting on the throne. And in his right hand, he has this book, this very same book. It was a book or a scroll with seven seals upon it. Until the seals are broken, you can't see inside it. Do you realize, and we'll go into this further in an entire message, do you realize this sealed book that's written on the inside and the outside represents something? When you go back into the Old Testament, you begin to find out that this has to do with the redemption of the entire earth. Now notice this, the four horses riding out. When the first horse rides out, it means it's the beginning of God redeeming the entire earth. This is it. This is the time that God is going to literally redeem the entire creation back onto himself. This is the actual hour. So as soon as the four horses ride out, all of the nations are going to begin to stir to bring forth prophetic events. Each of the four horses initiate certain events, certain things in the nations of the entire world, things that are going to shake our world. But you've got to understand when things happen in our world, Christ has a plan to redeem the earth back to himself. He's not simply going to destroy the earth. He is going to take up possession and reign upon it for 1,000 years. And then he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. But here in Revelation 5, we see this book or this scroll with its seven seals in the hand of the Father. We see that they begin to weep and John begins to weep because who is there found worthy to open up the seals and to reveal the prophecies? We see that it was Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. One, only one is found worthy who can open up the seal. And it is the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't realize that Christ is sovereign over these events, you're going to be terrified. You're going to get scared about world events. You're going to think that the devil has his way and man has his way and that there's no power in God until he comes in the air. But I want to tell you that the Lord Jesus Christ never hands over time to anyone or to any other creature. And so we see this is the first vision that we see here. This is going to be the beginning with Revelation chapter 6 verse 1, it's the beginning of prophecy in the book of Revelation. And it's going to continue through to chapter 22. It's a prophecy book. But we are literally looking at the first event that's going to start everything off. What is it? It is the white horse. This white horse is so important that when it gets revealed, released and sent forth, it is the beginning or initiating of a whole series of events that will never stop and that no man can turn back. There'll be no delays until Jesus comes to reign on the earth and redeem the nations unto himself. And so we see that it is the Lamb of God who opens the seal. Only he can do it. Time is in his hands. Power is in his hands alone. If you're going to begin to understand the book of Revelation, do you know what you need to do? Go back to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. To the name of the entire book of Revelation. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. That word revelation is the Greek word word akaluptus, where we get the word apocalypse from. Now in our common English language, if you talk about apocalypse, people think of wars and disasters and famines and earthquakes and all manners of things like that. That's what they think. And yet the word apocalypse does not mean that. When we talk about the four horsemen of the apocalypse, it's the four horsemen of revelation. This word apocalypse does not mean Armageddon. It's not talking about antichrist. 
You know what this book is called? The Revelation, the Apocalypse of Jesus Christ. The word means to disclose, to reveal, or to remove the covering, or to remove the veil so that you can see Jesus Christ. If you come to the book of Revelation and to the first seal, and all you see is war and judgment and disaster, you don't understand the book of Revelation. You see, the book of Revelation is to take the cover off and show you who Jesus Christ really is. When you see world events go on, I mean political chaos, wars, disasters, do your eyes go heavenward? Are all these things actually revealing to you who the person of Jesus Christ is? When you begin to see Bible prophecy come to pass, do you realize it's revealing that he is sovereignly in control? He is the only one that can reveal what is going to happen. Only God knows the future. When you come to the book of Revelation, you have, and listen this carefully, first of all, you have the seven seals. Then you have the seven trumpets. Then you have the seven vials are cups of wrath being poured out. Most people, when they come to Revelation, they begin reading from Revelation 6, the first seal. They read through the seven seals. They read through the seven trumpets. They read through the seven vials. And they try to read it as one complete history. They think it begins here and continues through. You will get very, very confused with that. You know why? Because the seventh seal, the seventh trumpet, and the seventh vial all finish at the same time. So we actually have two entire histories in the book of Revelation. No, we have three entire histories all playing out through the book of Revelation. And if you don't understand that, you'll get very confused. You see, first of all, you have the seven seals being opened by Jesus. In the seventh and the last seal, do you know what you have? You actually have the seven trumpets. The seven trumpets don't begin until the seventh seal. But then the seven trumpets and the seven vials are the same. They actually are merged together. Fourteen distinct prophecies, but they merge together as seven distinct events through the book of Revelation. And when you begin to study it and you begin to understand this, you can tell time schedule from the book of Revelation. Let me prove it to you here a moment. We're going to go to the four horses and that's our concentration in this uh, Bible teaching. But let me take you to the fifth seal, the sixth seal and the seventh seal. If you understand what those three seals are, then you know when the four horsemen are going to come. The fifth seal is the great tribulation. The sixth seal is the cosmic blackout. And the seventh seal is the day of the Lord when the seven trumpets begin to sound and the wrath of God is poured out. Now listen carefully. If you go to Matthew 24, what Jesus taught, he taught about the great tribulation. At the end of it, the cosmic blackout, everything's going to go black. And then at the end of that, about the day of the Lord, the three events of Matthew 24, we read about in the fifth, the sixth and the seventh seal. Do you know what this actually means? This means that the four horsemen come before the three and a half years of tribulation. They don't come during it. They don't come after it. The four horsemen, what they represent, have to come before the great tribulation. How does the great tribulation start? It begins with the abomination of desolation in the book of Daniel. As soon as you see the abomination standing in the temple in Jerusalem, the great tribulation begins. When you go to the book of Revelation, we see the great tribulation that's talked about in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we see it in the fifth seal. What is in the fifth seal? The saints are suffering, the martyrs, and they're crying out, when are we going to get avenged? That's what the fifth seal is. The fifth seal marks the great tribulation. 
Now, that might be a lot to take on board, but just shelf it for a second. And let me show you that these four horsemen ride out to prepare the way for the abomination of desolation. The first point here we have is the vision open. There is an opening of this vision. When Christ actually breaks the seal and opens the vision contained in it, when that event begins, you've got all of time sequence beginning. I actually believe that this first seal, this first horseman, marks the beginning of the last seven years of Bible prophecy. Halfway through, the great tribulation begins. But these seven years begin when the seal is broken and this first horseman begins to ride out. And so you can begin to understand scripture. You can begin to put it together. The, f- the seven seals are all negative. They are judgments. They are a series of disasters that come upon the world and the nations of the world that are finally going to bring forth the plan of God. And these four horsemen are united together. What one is, the other three are. But they each represent something different. And so we see that Christ opens up the vision. My second point here concerning Revelation and verse 6. And we read about it in verse 2. The vision expounded. Not only the vision opened, Christ does that. But we have here the vision expounded. Or let me explain what the vision actually means. You see, I don't believe it's Antichrist or Christ or coronavirus. Not at all. But what is it? I believe time and time again I can prove to you what it actually represents. We have two verses concerning this first seal. And it's explained in verse 2. And I saw and behold a white horse and he that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given unto him and he went forth conquering and to conquer. The first thing to notice here is that it is a white horse. We saw that the horses of Zechariah 1 and Zechariah 6, they represented, the horses and chariots represent angelic beings. The horses going forth represented God's plan and purpose in the earth that would stir up wars, disasters, that would stir up a shaking of the nations to bring forth his plan. And so we see the horse here. The color of the horse is white. It symbolizes something. The color of the horse symbolizes something like with Zechariah chapter 1 and chapter 6. It is symbolic. It has a spiritual meaning, a supernatural meaning, and it represents physical prophetic events that begin to happen on the earth. Notice this. In order to understand who the man and the horse is and the horse, do you remember last week we said the fourth horse with its rider? The rider, who was he? He's death. He's an angelic being. He is a person sitting on the fourth horse. You can't make the first horse rider Jesus and the fourth horse rider death or a demon that's going to be cast into hell. You see, all four riders are spiritual beings. They are angels. And each of these angels are being sent forth to actually stir up events in the nations that are going to bring about God's will upon the earth. This first horse rider on the white horse, I believe, is an angelic being. I believe he is a fallen angel, an evil angel, or a spirit riding on the back of the horse. If we are to agree with Zechariah and agree with the fourth horse, what he is, the rider of it, then we begin to understand the rider of this first white horse has to be a fallen angel that has been sent to accomplish something in the earth. In other words, he's not bringing peace. He's not preaching the gospel. He is not bringing something good. It is a judgment released by Jesus Christ. If the first thing is good and the others are bad, we're going to run into problems here. But people say, but it's a white horse. 
And in the book of Revelation, white usually represents righteousness, victory, no guilt, being cleansed, or a fresh start. This horse is a white horse symbolizing something that's going to get released on the earth at a very specific time. And when that horse gets released, everything is going to happen in the book of Revelation. It triggers the entire book of Revelation. It all begins to happen at that point. Notice it also says, he that sat on him. So you've got the white horse, the man sitting on the horse, and it is a white horse. We have the entire picture set here. It says, he that sat on him had a bow. Notice he doesn't have a name. The man on the fourth horse has a name. His name is death. This rider has no name. But he does have certain things that we can identify him with. It says that he had a bow. So this rider on the white horse, he is there on the back of the horse with a bow on his hand. What does the bow in the Bible represent? It is an instrument of war. In fact, the bow represents military power. And the bow isn't face-to-face conflict. It is warfare at a great distance. That's what the bow represents. It is not hand-to-hand combat with a sword, looking your enemy in the eye. The bow represents the power of military force. In the Old Testament, anytime you read about the, the power of the bow, do you know what God is saying? He's talking about the nations, the power of the bow. When he breaks it, it means he's broken their military power. And this is extraordinary military power. Do you know when a bowman fires an arrow, it usually hits you before you see it or you hear it. Sometimes you hear the whistle of an arrow and go, what's that? And then it hits you. It's an extraordinary weapon. So this rider on the white horse, he's got a bow that represents military power. He is like a sniper of the first century. What it's talking about here is someone with remarkable military power who's going to initiate the book of Revelation. And what he does, it's going to be sudden, unexpected, and hidden. He comes looking like he's righteous. He looks very similar to the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet he has military power in his hand. Although he has it and he possesses it, We actually see in this seal, he doesn't kill anybody. He makes no war. He looks like a military power. And yet when you read about this seal, as we're about to hear, there is no bloodshed. Nobody dies. And in fact, there's no arrows. Notice he's got a bow in his hands, but he's not firing arrows. Neither does he say that he has arrows with him. You see, I believe it's talking about military power with diplomacy right across the world. Look further, it says, and he had, and a crown was given unto him. So he's got a bow, military power, and a crown was given unto him. He didn't earn it. He didn't deserve it. He didn't fight for it. Before he goes forth to conquer, he is given a crown. Right at the beginning, he's given a crown before he wages war, before he goes forth with the power of the bow. He actually has a crown given to him. What does this crown represent? It's not the royal crown. You know, in Revelation 19, Jesus has a diadem on his head. That is a royal uh, crown upon, sorry, let me say that again. He has a Stephanos. There's two different Greek words for crown, a Stephanos and a diadem. Here, this white rider has a diadem on his head. But in Revelation chapter 19, Jesus has a Stephanos, which is a royal crown. In other words, government or power or authority to rule. He actually has that royal designation. But this rider here has a diadem. What is the diadem? It is a war wreath or a victor's crown. You know, at the Olympics, this is the crown that an Olympic runner wins or a great general who wins a war. He got crowned with a victor's wreath. But notice here, he's getting crowned before he does anything. 
He's getting a victor's crown, or it's in the position of as a victor that he goes forth to do all that he's going to do. In other words, his victory comes out through this. It goes further and says, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. He is crowned. He is military power. He has the testimony of being victorious, but he also in that position goes forth to conquer and to conquer. It says in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 3 about the second horse with its angel rider. Notice what it says. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast come and see, and there was another horse that was red. The red horse that we're going to see next week, the red represents war. And in fact, people die in the second seal. The horse, uh, uh, the red horse clearly represents bloodshed or war. And it says the power was given to him to that sat there on to take peace from the earth. Before you take peace from the earth with war, there's got to be peace. Do you see that clearly there? In verse 4, it says, The rider on the red horse rides forth in war, and he takes away peace from the earth, and they kill one another. So it is the second horse that's going to bring war. But there has to be peace in the earth before you can take it away from war. I believe the first horse brings peace. Do you know that in that first seal, there's going to be peace upon the earth. Peace has to um, be manifest, quietness, prosperity, before the second horse rides out to remove that peace. And so this first rider, notice the picture we're beginning to see. We're seeing a white rider on the horse with great military power, remarkable military power. And yet he isn't using it for war, but he does possess it. You can see it. It is the power of military force, but he's not killing anyone. There's no war. In fact, his power, his military power, as he rides forth, in white, representing peace, representing prosperity, representing what he's going to do in the world. Do you realize how deceptive this first horse is? When you see this horse coming, will you think this is a judgment from an angelic being? Will you actually think this is a bad thing? Or will the nations of the world say, surely this is our hour of peace? Do you remember Paul writing? And he said, an hour is coming where they're going to say, peace, peace. And he said, there shall be no peace. There's going to be an hour. We live in an hour and generation where everyone's being told, sure, you'll be okay. Even people in the church, sure, live like a devil, but you'll be okay. I want to tell you, that sort of message is a false message. When people start telling you, sure, you're living in sin, but peace be unto you. Sure, the Lord will just bless you. That is a false message. And we're moving into an hour where we're listening to politicians and leaders. There's going to be a strong proclamation. We're going to bring peace in the earth. We hold, we possess military power, and yet we're speaking peace. Do you see this white horse? As he rides out across the nations of the world, It says there in Revelation 6 and 3 about the second, sorry, verse 4, about the second horse. It says there went out another horse that was red. The word another there is alos. It means another of the same kind. The Greek word heteros means you're a girl, I'm a boy. Heteros, heterosexual. You're not the same as me. I know the world now doesn't know that. But you know what? The Bible makes a difference when it talks about a heteros horse is radically different. But you know what he says? That first horse and that second horse, they're not radically different. It's another of the same kind. A white horse is very like the red horse. But when you look at it, you don't think that. You think one is a horse of peace, the other is a horse of war. I want to tell you they are very, very similar. They are very alike. And yet the first one rides out with a message of peace, saying we've got all power, we've got military power, but we're bringing peace to you. The second horse brings 
bloodshed and removes that peace and brings war into the earth. Notice it says, he went forth conquering and to conquer. A crown on his head, the victor's crown. He goes forth saying, I've already got the victory. I've been crowned with victory. It's been given to me. I will fulfill it. Do you realize this horse cannot be stopped? He is crowned with victory and power. Nobody is going to stop this horse. Nobody. It is unstoppable. It says to, he's going forth to conquer and to conquer. He's got an entire career. Whatever this horse represents, it's an entire career that is overwhelming and it overwhelms the nations. And notice what it's conquering. It is conquering nations and peoples and the generation that's then alive. He goes forth to conquer. It's an entire career. You know what I believe it is? And I'm going to tie this in and prove it to you further. I'm just laying a foundation. I believe this white horse represents diplomacy, political diplomacy worldwide that has military power behind it. In the hand, it has the power of the bow or military power that's unbelievable. Notice here, there is victory. They are conquering nations. They are conquering that generation. This rider is going to win victory after victory after victory. But what's his message? Peace. It is diplomacy with power in his hand. I believe these are bloodless victories. There's no war. There's no death. That's in the next seal. But here's someone winning victory after victory, and yet there's no bloodshed. There's no death. There's no armies on the field. It is a bow without arrows. It is worldwide peace. In other words, this man on the white horse, he is bringing worldwide peace that very quickly, it's not going to last long, it is temporary. But he has to win victories. He has to defeat certain people. He has to win battles. But it's battles of words, diplomatic, political. And so he is waging war against those he considers enemy. It's a real warfare. He is a soldier in the battle. Believe me, the victories he win in, he has to subdue and defeat certain people in order to gain these victories. It is a bloodless victory, but it brings worldwide peace. It is peace being forced on the nations. It is manipulation. It is a power, a spiritual movement let loose on the earth by Christ which is going to envelop the politics of our world and cover our entire world, conquering nations in pursuit of peace. In other words, we want peace, therefore we need to conquer you in order to bring this peace. But no battles get fought. Do you realize where we're going in our world and it's getting there very fast? Nations conquered by a peace movement. Who has ever seen anything like this? It is conquering peace, victorious peace, military and political power. And yet peace is the thing. We want peace, but the threat of war is behind it. These wars are fought from a place of absolute victory. And look at the white horse. It is a white horse. Maybe it's a religious horse, a moral horse. Maybe it's claiming to be Christ-like. It has ethics, righteousness, a real cause. We're standing for what is right in the world. Since I'm expounding to you the vision, I'm simply explaining what this white rider, there's very little information given about him. My third point, the vision in biblical context. You see, many people take one verse about this white rider and they ride off into the sunset create many ideas and it doesn't tie into other scripture. I believe the seals show us when it happens. I don't mean the year. I don't mean that. None of us know that. But you know what? I believe we see the order of events in the last days. And it's going to be initiated by this wide road, white rider who conquers nations and brings about world peace. My third point, the vision in biblical context. If that is true, then I can tie this into other verses in the Bible. 
I, I will be able to prove it from other prophecies in the same similar time and show you how it fits together. I was raised many years ago by older preachers. They used to say, if you take a text of scripture, a verse of scripture, out of its context, it becomes a pretext. Now that's very true. But you listen and you go, well, what's a pretext? Let me explain what a pretext is. If you take this one scripture about the white horse, if you take it out of all the biblical teaching, out of context, it becomes a pretext. What's a pretext? Listen at the definition of it. A reason given in justification of a course of action that is not the real reason. That's a pretext. Remember what they say, a false pretext. It is a purpose alleged or an apparent, an appearance assumed in order to cloak the real intention or state affairs. So if you take one scripture like this out of its context, it becomes a pretext. It looks radically different. I want to keep this scripture as I've explained it here, as is written here. Do you know in Revelation 17, an angel gives the interpretation. We don't have it in Revelation 6. Revelation 17 is an easy prophecy to interpret because first you get the vision, you get the symbols. Then the angel says, let me explain it to you. So Revelation 17 is very easy if you listen to the angel. The angel says, I'll give you the interpretation. We don't have it in Revelation 6. But third of all, let me give the vision in its biblical context from elsewhere. Let me begin to show you from other prophecies what I believe this is. In Daniel chapter 8 and verse 25, we read about the rise of the little horn or a man who's going to be called the Antichrist. In fact, in Daniel, we read that he appears seven years before he's bound and put in the, in the pit of hell. He rises up and is seen on the scene of history for seven years. But for the first three and a half years, according to Daniel, he is a man of peace. Listen to what it says. Daniel chapter 8, 25. Speaking about the little horn that's going to rise. And through his policy, in other words, he has a way of operating he has a political way of operating. He's a little horn. He's a little king. He's a politician. What is a politician? He's a diplomat. He's involved in politics with military power behind him. And through his policy also, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart. And listen this, and by peace shall destroy many. When the little horn arrives on the scene of world politics, the Bible is very clear. He'll magnify himself and through peace destroy many. When the Antichrist arrives on the scene, he doesn't come with war and destruction. The one who will later initiate the great tribulation three, year, three and a half years into the seven years. The one that's going to bring great tribulation and turmoil to the nations. When he first appears, he's an eloquent politician. He is a diplomat. And in fact, he gains power through peace. That's how he initiates it. Daniel speaks much about this and that he shall obtain the kingdom by flatteries. He's going to be a very smooth political character. He is smooth on his words. He's like Herod the Great. He gets in with all the top world leaders. He's a very smooth, charismatic operator. But Antichrist is going to arise through peace, through speaking peace. And he shall stand up against the prince of princes. And he shall be broken without hand. We see that this one that's going to come in as a mediator of peace is going to be destroyed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Then listen again to Daniel chapter 11. You'll, you'll remember there's many references to the rise of the little horn. And you'll remember there was a character we dealt with in Daniel's series of another king 
that was going to arise in the Middle East who was a picture or a type. Antiochus, Epiphanes. So Daniel chapter 11 is a prophecy about the type or the shadow of Antichrist. Listen again to what it says. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdoms by flattery. The very same thing as Antichrist. How Antichrist is going to begin his political career. This Antioch done it the very same way. He come in through peace. He's going to destroy many through peace. He's going to gain power through peace. And he's going to begin to arise. You see, I believe the first three and a half years of the reign of the little horn who becomes the Antichrist, he is a man of peace. He comes speaking peace and yet he's got military power behind him. It goes on further. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully. He makes a covenant of peace, but he begins to work deceitfully. Listen again to what it says in Daniel chapter 9. There's an entire biblical teaching about this. That we, when we begin to see the last seven years begin, it's going to begin in a condition of peace. The last seven years is brought in, birthed in. Christ opens the seventh seal. What is the mark of the beginning of last days? It is peace and prosperity. It is a putting aside of war. Could you imagine us suddenly watching world events where world peace comes? I mean, not through weapons and war. And here we are, the Christians saying, you need to be careful. We see the stage being set. The politicians are saying, peace, peace. We want the end of war. We want to cure all diseases. We want to heal all your sicknesses. We want to supply all your financial needs. You ought to get very worried. You see, in this COVID crisis, when they say, we want you to be in benefits and we want to pay all your bills. We, we want a standard income wage for every person in the world. And we care about your granny and we care about your health so much. We want you to get vaccinated every year. We care about your health. We care about your wealth. We care about peace in the world. That ought to make you very nervous. I'm not being funny here, but you're seeing something begin to emerge in our world that's setting the stage for this. They come saying, peace, peace, but we're going to see the greatest crisis in world history arise in the middle of it. Remember in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel has revealed to him about the last seven years that come on the earth. How does it begin? How does those seven years begin? that's going to line up with the first seal, the white horse beginning in Revelation. Because in Daniel 9, you have what begins or initiates the seven years. In Revelation 6, you have what begins or initiates the seven years. And when you tie it together, it's the same thing. In Daniel 9, 27, talking about this little horn, and he, the prince, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the ablation to cease. For the overspreading of the abomination, he shall make it desolate. Daniel 9 shows there's going to be seven years. It's going to be a covenant of peace signed with the nation of Israel. And when you go to Matthew 24, Jesus warns, when you see the abomination of desolation, the tribulation begins, the great tribulation upon the earth. So before that tribulation, what do you have? You have a period of three and a half years. How is that three and a half years initiated? By a man, a little horn, a prince, a politician, who makes a covenant for seven years. And he said that it's a seven year peace deal with Israel. Isn't that what Israel are looking for today? Isn't the entire Middle East and world politics looking for peace with the little nation of Israel? We are told who it is, the little horn. But you see, I believe the little horn initiating a seven year covenant is going to tie in to this first horse of the apocalypse when this first horse gets unsealed and released and sent forth 
Do you know what? I believe it's the start of the seven years. So what does all of this represent? Does it represent the Antichrist and his peace deal? No. It's something far bigger than that. In fact, I believe it's so big that that little horn signing a seven-year, confirming, establishing a seven-year peace deal, I believe that's only going to be an insignificant event in all that happens in the releasing of the white horse. The white horse is something far bigger than the little horn signing a seven-year peace deal with Israel. It is far, far bigger than that. So what is it? In Revelation chapter 17, verse 12, it talks about the ten horns. The ten horns that come before the little horn. In fact, they need to be in place with a new world government before the little horn arises. He will not sign that peace agreement until it is part of the ten kings being put in place. Who are these ten kings? It says in Revelation 17 and 12, these 10 kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive power as kings one hour with the beast. 10 politicians, world rulers. I believe the entire world's going to be split into 10 regions with 10 kings. And do you know what? These 10 world leaders, they get power all at the same time. They're not 10 world leaders that just come together. That doesn't happen. These are 10 world leaders who would say, right, we're cre creating a whole new form of world government. And as that world government is formed, all 10 of you are going to receive power and authority to be kings and to rule over the earth. You're going to get it instantaneous. I believe this happens with the first seal. This first seal of diplomacy and political power riding out into the earth, conquering nations, conquering peoples, bringing peace, and there's no bloodshed. I believe it's a common world government. It says in Revelation chapter 13 and 1, again, when this political beast is seen, it's got seven heads, ten horns. And in Revelation 13, upon his ten horns, crowns. That means Revelation 13 is talking about these ten kings when they're in position. Not the little horn, not the Antichrist. Revelation 13 begins with these ten world leaders, politicians. Do you know what they're going to be? Men of peace. Men who say politically, we want to bring peace in the earth. Now let me bring it to the last point. This is going to tie in. But you need to see it all. Then you take it away. You go back to scripture. And you decide. Is this horse Jesus Christ? Is it the gospel over the past 2,000 years? Is it just the person of Antichrist? Is it coronavirus? You're going to have to decide. My fourth and last point. The vision applied to our day. Where are we? You see, this hasn't happened yet. It is future. Those ten kings being crowned is future. The little horn signing a seven-year peace covenant with Israel is future. The little horn or antichrist coming in with peace, with political intrigue, is future. But I want to apply it to our day. Let me give you a little overview of history. And now I apply all of this on why I interpret the way I do. The vision applied to our day. Let me take you back to the 18th century in Europe or in France. And to the French philosophers that dominated France and Germany and Europe and have affected all of the political leaders of our generation. In fact, these French philosophers created the doctrine and the teaching that brought about the French Revolution. Those that brought about the French Revolution, a revolution that was chaotic, believed what these philosophers taught. Do you know what it was? Do you know what their main central teaching was? Of all the great French philosophers, this was it. 
perpetual peace. It was a thing they called perpetual peace or world peace or the end of wars. There were great French philosophers like Immanuel Kant, Pierre, Rossier. If you know the French philosophers, you know what all of them taught. I've read portions of their books and they talk about perpetual peace. They talk about how to get world peace. Do you know how they say you have to get world peace where entire world war stops? Do you know in their philosophy how they say to bring it about? You need a world government. That is central. Inside the Trojan horse, the world peace is a one world government. From back in the 18th century, all the French philosophers taught this. All the revolutionists in France taught this and believed this. They actually, and this is in their teaching, to do away with sovereign nation states. You want peace? You have to take away the sovereignty of Ireland and England and America and Germany and France. You've got to remove that. If you take away national sovereignty and bring in this global government, then you're going to have peace. And in the, the, those French philosophers, they said, first, we need to do it in Europe. We need a united federal Europe. And this is the words they use. We need a federal Europe unified with a European legal system, political and legal. And then that is going to be the beginning for all of the world to come into this peace. You see, the secret to their peace is a one world government. In fact, what they used to teach was private property is the cause of all wars. And so in order to have world peace, we've got to remove private property. We've got to sign treaties between nations, contracts or covenants. And as you sign peace deals and covenants with nations, you're drawing them into a global governance or government. They talked about using international law, having one law that's going to govern the entire world, about creating a world federation. But to get a world federation, you need a world revolution. France was only the first part of it. France was meant to be a worldwide revolution, not just a national revolution. And listen, they taught that you're to bring this world peace by force. Do you see with this horseman, on the white horse, with his bow and his crown. Do you understand why I'm saying this? This affects every single nation in our world from that time straight down to today. They actually taught you've got to cause peace to come. Get certain amount of nations in, then force the rest, even through war, to come into this. They believed in the innate goodness of man, the ability of all mankind to be perfect. And in fact, this teaching and ideology about bringing about a world government to bring world peace. Do you know who got gripped with the French or, or the teaching of the French philosophers? Freemasons. The Freemasons read this philosophy and made it a part of their Freemasons, uh, their, their Freemasonry. Also, the um, Bavarian Illuminati read these philosophies and said, the way to world peace and to perfection, how, what do you do? It's a world government. We've got to bring about a world government. Why? Because we love peace. We want peace in the world. We want an end to war. So they talked about world revolution, world federation, world peace. Thomas Paine was a part of this. He left the French Revolution. He was an Illuminatist. He went to America to try and hijack the, French, the American Revolution. And listen to this. Thomas Paine turned up in Ireland and was central to the United Irishmen rising up in Ireland to say, let's have a free Ireland. Who was it that was in there teaching them their doctrine? I need to research this more. But I'm telling you, Thomas Paine was right in the center saying, you Irishmen need to rise up. You know why? Because they want to eventually lead us into a world government. 
You know, Ireland all these years said, we want a united Ireland. We want a free Ireland. We, we want to be free of Great Britain imperialism. And then they walk into a united Europe. And now they're walking into the fourth industrial revolution. How crazy can you get? I'm more a nationalist than any southern provo, I want to tell you. Far more. You know why? We ought to have national sovereignty. Sinn Féin is a globalist movement. Labour in Ireland is a globalist movement. All of them are leading in a certain direction. I want to tell you, I'm a true nationalist because I'm a Bible-believing Christian. All these ideologies from the French philosophers spread worldwide. I believe it is this horseman. I believe it's embodied that you've got to conquer through diplomacy. You have military power, but you bring peace by bringing in a world government. That is the ten kings. And in the background is a little horn bringing peace. He's going to become famous for his peace. Let me just as we close here tonight, give you a brief overview of how this was implemented and what the next stage is. Because I believe the next stage is Revelation chapter 6. And this world is going to be deceived. Before Antichrist, before the mark of the beast, before worldwide bloodshed, do you know what's going to be offered to the nations of the world? Peace and prosperity, security. You're going to be handed everything you ever wanted. You remember the first world war? What a terrible war. Beginning in 1914 through to 1918. What came out after it? The League of Nations was meant to be the first embodiment of the French philosophy. This was meant to be it. That after war, we now have peace. We've lived in war for four years. Europe has been drenched in blood. But the idea was to have a League of Nations where nations would be joined together and lose their sovereignty. The original plan for the League of Nations was to be a world government. I mean that nations would lose their sovereignty. Do you know who created this idea at that time? A man called Andrew Carnegie, the second richest man in the world. In 1907, he created the term League of Nations. Seven years before the war, he wrote about a League of Nations losing their sovereignty, coming together and creating a world government. The two richest men in the world, Rockefeller and Carnegie, began to pour their wealth into world peace. We are men of peace and we put our wealth there. They created peace societies. They created books, sent out books. And in those books about world peace, they said, we need a one world police force. We need a one world government. I'm not talking about the 2000s. I'm talking about over 100 years ago. In fact, I've got books on my computer written by Baptist ministers, preachers in America. And they're saying we need a one world government, a one world army. We need a one world uh, system. We need to raise it up. Do you know where all of this came through? The money was being poured out. And the plan for political peace meant unity. And spiritual, religious peace meant unity. Let me just mention H.G. Wells. Some of you know him as the author of The Invisible Man. That's how he became famous. He's called the father of science fiction. But that's not all he's known for. From the year 1900 to 1944, he wrote incessantly about world government a world republic, the federation of all nations, a one state world, a doing away of nationality and controlling the population of the world. He called it the open conspiracy. He named it the new world order. Gorbachev and Bush didn't create that statement. It's a very old statement. What is the new world order? It's a one world government, brought in through a peace process. That's how you bring it in. An elite who would act greater than the about world peace. They began to write books together about the League of Nations even before the war came about. Saints, what I'm telling you is the League of Nations that was brought about by Woodrow Wilson 
Lord Milner and many others. They were all men who believed this in a one world government. Woodrow Wilson wrote from as early as 1887 about creating a global government. How do you do it? You do it through peace. At the end of the First World War, they, cre they created the League of Nations in Paris. At Paris, they had a great gathering of the nations at the end of the war. And in Paris, they signed the Peace Covenant. And out of that covenant, they birthed the first world government. The only problem is the American people voted against Woodrow Wilson. He was fully in this, saying, we brought America into a world government. We are going to do this. There was only one problem. Preachers all over England and America, like R.A. Torrey, F.B. Meyer, W.E. Vine, Billy Sunday, and many others, began to preach that this is part of Bible prophecy. And the American government rose up and voted against their... their um, um, their, their leader at that time, it all fell apart. The two secretaries of the League of Nations resigned within a short time. They had been told nations will lose their sovereignty. When they realized it wasn't going to happen, they resigned from the League of Nations that was meant to bring about war. Do you realize at the end of the Second World War, in 1945, right at the end, there was created the United Nations, which replaced the League of Nations. 51 nations joined together in the United Nations. And now that United Nations has become the instrument of bringing this forth. The cliche, our motto, of the United Nations is world peace. They're always talking about world peace, yet they haven't brought peace. Do you know that every Pope since 1945, the Second World War, every single Pope has pointed to the United Nations and said, we need to give it greater power and teeth. We need to empower the United Nations. It's not strong enough. Do you know when it was first created, the father of the New Age movement and the mother of the New Age movement, they all said it is the fulfillment of all that we've ever labored for. This is the organization. The New Age movement, the Catholic Church, world politicians, all saying that the United Nations is going to bring about world peace, everlasting peace. That political institution and you know what? We're at an hour now where we're watching. It affects your education. It's affecting our health. It's affecting everything within our nations. Agenda 2030 was started by the UN. And you know what? They're trying to converge everything in this decade. Where are we on the calendar of Bible prophecy? Come an awful lot more, I could say. But you know what? I want you to understand you test for yourself. When we begin to read Revelation chapter 6, and the seals begin to open, and the first horse rides out, with bow in hand, a crown on his head, a victor's crown, and all you see is the white horse, and he's conquering and conquering. Are we seeing the stage set for the bringing forth of a one world government. But it's going to be hid in the Trojan horse of perpetual peace that politicians and nations have written about and spoken about for centuries, if not millennia. I believe we're at a radical point in world history. And the stage is being set. And as we see the rise and the preparation for a world government, you're going to see a type of politician rise up. They'll say, peace, peace. All that we're doing is seeking to bring in peace. And the end justifies the means. Will you pray with me here?
Lord God, we realize that Jesus Christ alone is the Prince of Peace. He's the only one that can bring peace to the heart, to our nations, to our world. We look for everlasting righteousness to be brought in. Only in the righteousness of Christ can we experience real peace with God and with man. And Father, I pray even tonight, Lord God, don't let us be deceived by politicians, Lord God, by false gospels, by kingdom now. Lord God, I pray there be a preparation in our hearts to see that the only way to bring peace in this world is to reconcile men and women unto the Lord Jesus Christ, is to preach the gospel of peace, that men must repent and believe in Jesus and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Lord God, I do pray, O oh God, that you'd save us from every deception in this hour, that you'd expose the powers of darkness that are being let loose in our world. And Lord God, that we had walk in the light of the written word of God. We do bless you tonight. We do praise you. And Father, as we begin to see everything happen before our eyes, let us know that Jesus Christ, he is in sovereign, absolute control of all things. We do love you tonight. We worship you. We bless you, Lord Jesus.